We've known about climate change for a couple of hundred years. We, the geologists. And we've known that climate change has been cyclical. And we know when we pull apart continents and stitch them back together again, we get a climate change. We know that when our solar system, moving at 26 kilometres a second, goes through various energetic parts of the galaxy, we have an ice age. We know that our planet's orbit wobbles on 100,000, 41,000 and 23,000 year cycles. We know that the sun is very, very variable and there are solar cycles which are well documented and we can see these in all sorts of features on planet Earth. We also know that we have other cycles that affect climate. These are the cycles we know. There are probably many that we don't know. But we've known about climate change for a very long period of time. And for people to suddenly discover that the planet is dynamic is really telling us how little they know about how the world works. Because when we look at the history of the planet, with the black line there, we can see atmospheric carbon dioxide. It has been decreasing. We are now, in the history of the planet, at one of the lowest periods of carbon dioxide. We also see the temperature is up and down. We see, coming from the left to the right, the first great fall in temperature was a glaciation. That was when we had high carbon dioxide. So clearly the whole idea of carbon dioxide driving climate has to be rejected immediately. We see it again. The second great dip in temperature. The third great dip in temperature. Again, relatively high carbon dioxide. And it's only now that we've got a cool climate and low carbon dioxide. Throughout the history of the planet, we've been a warm, wet greenhouse planet. And we've had very high carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So the evidence from geology completely destroys any concept that CO2 gives us climate change. We can look at more recent times. The evidence from ice. The blue is cold and the red is hot. Polar bears first appeared before that first warm spot at 400,000 years. They've survived warm periods before. It's quite normal for organisms to survive warm and cold periods. We humans live on the ice sheets, we live in the mountains, we live on the coast, we live in deserts, we live in a great diversity of environments, as do many other organisms. So again we see that there are great cycles of climate change, and these cycles can change very, very rapidly. We can also see that these cycles are expressed as carbon dioxide in the blue, the methane in the green, temperature in the red, and there are all sorts of other things we can measure. And we see over the history of time we have cycles. And not once have we had a runaway greenhouse, even though temperatures might have been higher, and even though carbon dioxide might have been higher. So <clears throat> we can look at the temperature from the Greenland ice core, and we can see that temperatures have changed in Greenland and warming has changed quite significantly in Greenland. We come back to that. We've also had a cooling period. And again, we come back to that. And all that's telling us is the planet is dynamic. But what we do see is when Antarctica warms, Greenland cools and vice versa. So <clears throat> the warming that we are currently enjoying started at about the middle of that diagram. We are in a post-glacial period, an interglacial period. It is a natural greenhouse. To the left of the diagram, temperatures are up and down. That is quite normal in cold times. On the right-hand side of the diagram, it's nice and stable, and temperatures only up and down a little bit. Again, we see that through all the cycles of climate change. So again, is our temperature change at present anything unusual? The answer is no. It's nothing unusual from what we've seen over the history of time. Well, during those, this post-glacial period, we've had some very, very cold snaps. And where temperature went down, that is the Younger Dryas, and we see in blue that the ice sheets have actually decreased during that period of time. This is contrary to what we get fed, and that's because we had higher rainfall during these... Um, warm times and lower rainfall in the dry times. So again, no matter what scale we look at the change of climate, it's very variable. Now this cold snap, the Younger Dryas, it took about 10 years 
to come out of an exceptionally cold climate into a warm climate. And the temperature rise was about 10 degrees Celsius. And we humans survived it. Very, very common to hear talk about El Nino and talk about the influence of volcanoes. And I want to come back to volcanoes because I'm arguing that one volcano can ruin your whole day. One volcano can change the whole earth and it has in the past and it will in the future. When we look at the global average temperatures taken high up in the atmosphere, it's cyclical. We have our El Nino events, a very big one of 1998, and we have volcanoes that have had a small effect. These are only very small volcanoes, and these are the volcanoes we see. It's the unseen ones that we should be frightened about. So, it doesn't look as if we've had much warming. Now, if we look since the last glaciation, the Pleistocene Ice Age, We've had in blue cold, then we've had a warming, then we've had a cooling, the Allurid, a warming, the Younger Dryas, a cooling, the Holocene warming, and then a cooling, and then a warming, and we get right down to the bottom, and we see the modern warming. This is cyclical climate. Now, no matter what sky we look at on, be it decades, hundreds of years, thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years, or millions of years, we have cycles. And we can only understand modern climate by looking backwards. And so what we do is we measure temperature. And so let's go around and start measuring temperature in urban areas. And this looks quite frightening because in the United States, all of these urban areas seem to have a temperature increase. And no matter where we go, over the last 100 to 150 years, we've had a temperature increase. We go into rural areas and we see the temperature starts to decrease. And of course, with all matters of science, you have one rogue measurement. And the rogue measurement is Death Valley. So when we look at temperature measurements done by thermometers, there is a problem. And the problem is that of bias. And here are the temperature measurement stations in red. They are biased towards industrial areas, industrialised Western countries, and there's a lack of measurement in third world countries and ocean areas. And we're having a very strong bias in any temperature measurements. And we can look at some of these temperature measurement stations. This is one in Arizona. And this particular measurement station has been here since 1867. So you say, well, that must give us a reliable long-term view of temperature. And we look at the measurements coming from that site since 1867 and it's inescapable. The temperature that has been measured has been increasing. But then you look at the site and you see you've got massive back reflection from concrete, you've got hot exhaust fumes, you've got air conditioning units, and what you're measuring is not temperature. What you're really measuring is something completely different. And you're measuring the population. And we see from temperature measurements in the United States the higher the temperature anomaly, the bigger the population. And what that's telling us? We humans are adding heat. This is the urban heat island effect. Now, because we have a bias in measurement, and most of the temperature measurements are taken in industrialised and urban areas, or areas that were once rural that are now urbanised, we can do it another way, and we can get into space. And we can start to look at temperature measurements from space. So when we look at temperature measurements, it's not really good quality material. It doesn't help us very much in understanding global temperatures. These get amended and corrected, and they just don't fit in with what we see from balloons and from satellites. And so the terrestrial temperature measurements are biased. Let's go somewhere else and look at what might happen from space. We've got quite a long record now of space measurements and they cover every square inch on the planet. And we're measuring the temperature here where we can compute a global temperature or northern hemisphere or southern hemisphere. And what we see are some cycles in there but 